Visitors are in this meeting. Open the people list to see the visitors who joined. Visitor indicate this call was oh, this call was being recorded. This call was open to anyone. This call was being recorded. Button collapsed. The presentation is being annotated. Button collapsed. Sub receive a bit button. You can't turn more options. Enter zoom bit button to mute sub receive more options. Audio set turn off mic video set turn off can't turn on cast enter yes sub receive raise hand let more options. We call meeting to show everyone live. Chat with everyone toggle button. Control E, your microphone is on. Control E, meet that PGDAZ online counseling for Cassidy. Control E, meet that PGDAZ online counseling for January 2020. You are not audible, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Yeah, okay, sir. Good evening, students. So today we'll be starting with the fourth unit of your uh, analytical chemistry, that is introduction to electroanalytical methods. This unit is basically an overall introduction to different analytical methods that we used in analytical chemistry. So in this unit, we will just have a revision of the basic of the basic principles of analytical chemistry, particularly electroanalytical chemistry. So before going for further emphasis to other methods, we'll just revise a few terminologies that we come across in analytical chemistry. So the first are the basic concepts that we need to know, that we need to be well aware while studying electroanalytical techniques. And particularly in electroanalytical chemistry, what we need to remember is that it is a specialist branch of analytical chemistry. In analytical chemistry, we need to analyze various types of compounds, materials, and which is, has become a core subject of today's development. So that is why electroanalytical chemistry has grown very popular and it has been it has garnered much attention recently owing to its precision and its easy handling. So let us start with some basic concepts that we need in electroanalytical chemistry. The first are some of the electrical units that we all are very aware of. These are the very some of the very common units that we come across every day. The first one is ampere. As we all know, ampere is the unit of current. So this was found by a French physicist and according to with respecting his name, we have this unit has been given his ampere for deriving from his name. Then the second common unit that we come across in electricity or electrochemical chemistry is ohm. Now the unit, the term ohm is the unit of electrical resistance and it has been given in honor of the German physicist G.S. Ohm. So a one ohm particularly describes the electrical resistance offered by a column of 114.45 gram of mass. Okay. The next common electrical unit that we come across is volt. The volt particularly measures the electromotive forces. That is how we commonly define it as EMF and the potential difference. The unit of EMF and potential difference is generally represented by volt and which we represent by capital V. Coulomb is another very common unit used in electrochemistry and Coulomb is particularly used to express the quantity of electricity. This word but Coulomb, it is represented by capital C and it has been given in honor of the French physicist C. A. Coulomb who found that 
one coulomb corresponds to a constant current of one ampere which flows through a particular substance for one second so coulomb it is represented in capital c next is a very important unit that we call it as faraday we represented it in capital f and it is defined as the quantity of electricity which is associated with one equivalent of chemical change in a electrochemical process now this faraday is particularly it is concerned with an electrochemical process and one faraday equals to 964964 sorry 96494 coulombs faraday is given in honor of the scientist m faraday and it is represented by capital f Siemens is another unit of electricity and it is actually the unit of electrical conductance and it is represented by capital S and it is given as A upon V where A represents the ampere and V represents the volt that is current upon potential difference. So these are some of the common units that we use in electrochemistry. Then there are concerning electrochemistry we have some basic laws the basic laws the first law the of electricity it usually concerns with the ohm's law ohm's law now we all know it is given by a i is equal to e upon r this is the mathematical representation of ohm's law the mathematical representation is just it from the mathematical representation we can the law states that the <clears throat> current flowing through a conductor is equal to the potential difference between any two points divided by the resistance between them so we can write it as e is equal to ir or sometimes we can write it as v is equal to ir where e and v both represent the potential difference in volts this is a very common law that is the ohm's law the next law that concerns is the faraday's law faraday's law states that the quantity of current in coulombs it is associated with an electron transfer process involved in the electrochemical reaction now the number of equivalents are the number of moles divided by the number of electrons that is taking part in the transformation reaction now the number of electrons that take part in a elo total electrochemical reaction is given by small l according to faraday's law q that is the quantity of current in coulombs is directly proportional to number of equivalents or mathematically we can write it as q is equal to f into number of equivalents or which is finally given as q is equal to number of moles that is represented by n and particularly here f is the faraday constant which is equal to 96494 coulombs and n represent the number of electrons that take part in the total transformation reaction in the electrochemical cell sometimes we write this n here the n in this equation it represents the number of species that is taking part in the electrochemical reaction now we have a very important terminology in electrochemistry that is called as electrode potential the electrode potential is very it is very crucial to the understanding of electroanalytical chemistry so before we proceed to the various parts of electroanalytical chemistry we need to know how an electrode develops a potential an electrode as such is not associated with any potential however when a metal or m it is placed in its solution salt solution so it is further it contains its ion mn plus so now the metal m and its ions mn plus they are in equilibrium with each other in the solution now here in this case two types of scenarios occur we can we will consider two types of metal like a less reactive metal such as copper and a more reactive metal like zinc and we will see what happens when we put them together in salt solutions now suppose if we put a, in the first case if we put copper in its solution of salt solution that is copper sulfate so what what we did here we took copper electrode and dipped it in its so copper sulfate solution here in this solution some of the copper ions they deposit on the copper metal so as a result what happens is the electrode the metal it develops 
a small slight positive charge whereas the solution it develops a slight negative charge and this particularly happens when we use copper in the second case if we take a metal like zinc and we dip it in a solution of its salt that is zinc zinc sulfate so this is the zinc sulfate solution and this is the zinc electrode in this case since zinc is a very reactive metal what happens here is at the interface of zinc and zinc sulfate the solution the zinc metal it develops a slight negative charge whereas the total solution it develops a slight positive charge now we can see in both the cases the positive charges and the negative charges they will be located at the surface of the metal solution phases that is the interface the so this difference as a result of the development of the charges at the interfaces a corresponding potential difference occurs between the metal and the solution now this potential difference that arises at the metal interface at the metal and metal ion interface due to the difference in the development of the charges is termed as electrode potential this is how an electrode potential is developed in a metal and metal ion surface now once an electrode potential it is developed we need to measure the in electrode potential however unfortunately till date we do not have a method for directly estimating the potential difference between the electrode and the solution so what we do we measure it indirectly with respect to an standard electrode in this case a standard electrodes was first proposed by the great scientist nonst who named the standard electrode as standard hydrogen electrode that is usually represented as she so this standard hydrogen electrode was given the value zero potential at all temperatures and this has been universally agreed by all the chemists throughout the world so thus if we want to measure the electrode potential of a particular solution the standard electrode that is she is taken with respect to the she the potential electrode potential of our sample is measured now in relation to this electrode potential there arises a very important factor that is called as liquid junction potentials this is usually represented as ljp now why does this liquid junction potential arise this particularly ljp arise when we mix two different electrolyte solutions and we bring to get bring them to a point of close contact an electrical potential arises at the junction of the contact so this potential difference when two different electrolyte solutions are brought together is termed as liquid junction potential ljp or simply sometimes it is called as diffusion potential now this is caused to the diffusion of ions from higher concentration to lower concentration depending on that is particularly ljp is particularly dependent on the concentration gradient of the two electrolytic solutions and the mobility of the ions present in both these electrolytes so for an example let us consider as shown in figure 1.2 let us consider two solutions two hcl solutions but they are of different concentrations one is 0.1 molar hcl that is taken in the left side of figure 1.2 and the other is 0.01 molar of hcl that is taken in the right side of figure 1.2 so what happens on making a contact of these solutions both the h plus ion and the cl plus ion they will start diffusing but since the ions can move from higher concentration to lower concentration the h plus and the cl minus ions they start coming from the 0.1 molar hcl side that is from the left side to the 0.01 molar hcl that is to the right side but between h plus and cl minus the h plus ions they move rapidly than the cl minus because of their small sizes and they reach the right side of the 
electrochemical cell faster so that is why the right side of the cell it slightly develops a positive charge and the left side with chloride minus ions are more abundant they develop a slight negative charge this is how we define a liquid junction potential but this potential this ljp occurs as a result of the mixing of different electrolytes in the solution so this potential the potential of the ljp it can be minimized by using a salt bridge we mostly consider potassium chloride uh, potassium chloride as the most commonly used salt bridge because the mobility of k plus ions and c plus ions they are quite similar so the, they are they move at a similar speed that is why potassium chloride has been employed as a salt bridge in many cases and it has been found that when the potassium chloride is dispersed in a agar gel they minimize the liquid junction potential and indicate the true potential of the electrochemical cell now regarding all this we have to define what is an electrochemical cell now an electrochemical cell is a whole setup of electrochemistry where the entire electrochemical reaction occurs it consists of two metallic electrodes immersed in the same electrolyte solution or in different electrolyte solutions but those must be in contact with the electrolyte an electrochemical cell particularly converts chemical energy into electrical energy and sometimes No, you are not audible. So we were talking about electrochemical cells. An electrochemical cell consists of two metallic electrodes that are immersed either in the metal, either in the electrolyte solution or in different solution, but they must be in contact with the electrolyte. The major function of an electrochemical cell is to convert chemical energy into electrical energy but sometimes we also have electrochemical cell that converts electrical energy into chemical energy but that depends into the type of the cell chemical reaction which might be either spontaneous in nature or they might be non-spontaneous in nature so when these according to this basis the electrical the cell they have been divided into mostly two types so the electrochemical cell which converts chemical energy into electrical energy is called as the galvanic cell alternatively the cell where the non spontaneous reaction occurs they are called as non electrolytic cell so we will gradually discuss the importance of electrochemical cells So first we will start with galvanic cells in a galvanic cell in a galvanic cell the system consists of two electrodes now as you can see there are two electrodes 
each part of the cell is called as a half cell. So one we have the right hand side and the other we have the left hand side that is called as the half cell. The, they, here in these half cells, the chemical reaction occurs. That is where the chemical reaction is converted into electrical energy. One such cell, the galvanic cell, is called as the Daniel cell. So here it is the figure 1.3 represents a general galvanic cell. So here in this cell, the solutions of the two half cells they are connected by a salt bridge. As you can see, this is the salt bridge, which is the KCL solution. And it is in inverted U shape, which connects both the half cells of the solution. The zinc electrode, on the other hand, it is immersed in zinc sulfate solution, whereas the copper electrode on the right side, it is immersed in copper sulfate solution. This is the second half. The zinc represents the one half. The copper represents the second half. So this combination was given by Galvani and that is why it is called as a galvanic cell or a Daniel cell. Now, here today, we mostly we are concerned with galvanic cell. Now, when the cell is closed, it operates spontaneously. Now, the copper has a high po positive potential than zinc and the electrons flow from zinc to copper in the circuit through the wire. Now, the flow of the currents, they generate the electric current and this flow of electrons mostly represents the amount of electric current passing through the total cell. The cell reactions in both the cells, the reactions are occurring, which we call it as the positive, the the reduction cell and the oxidation cell. So at the copper electrode, the copper electrons are reduced and this is known as the cathode. Whereas in the zinc electrode, the electrons are supplied, which is done by the oxidation and this represents the anode. So here, when we talk of a galvanic cell, the copper electrode represents the cathode and the zinc electrode, it represents the anode. So thus, Overall, when we write the convention of the galvanic cell, we can write it like this. In this, the equation, as we can see here, the zinc single vertical bar, zinc 2 plus, bracketed activity of Zn2 plus, the salt bridge, Cu2 plus, activity of Cu2 plus, single vertical bar, Cu. This represents the reaction of a total electrochemical cell. Now, when we look at the left side, it indicates that zinc gets converted to Zn2 plus with exchange by losing two electrons. And on the right hand side, Cu2 plus gains two electrons to become Cu. And thus the net cell reaction, the overall cell reaction can be given as a zinc plus zinc plus Cu2 plus giving rise to Zn2 plus plus Cu. Now the over when, when there is no liquid junction potential, the total EMF of the cell will be given as the potential difference between the two electrodes. That is E cell is given by E cathode minus E anode. This is the general representation of any galvanic cell that we come across. E is equal to E of the cathode, the total electrode potential of the electrochemical cell is given as the electrode potential of the right electrode where the cathodic reactions takes place, that is the reduction reaction takes place and E left that indicates the left electrode which is mostly concerned with that of the occurring with the anode. So here the cell EMF Using all this convention, the E cell for the Daniel cell may be written as E cell E Cu2 plus by Cu minus E Zn2 plus Zn. The EMF of a cell is always positive. That is why it is written that E cell is positive. So this is a basic introduction to the electrochemicals, the representation of electrochemical cell and the oxid the other half reactions of both the cells. Now M the electrode potential of the total electrochemical cell. Now, the non-stick equation. The electrode potential of redox cell 
it varies with the concentrations and oxidized form of the of, of the reactions so the relationship between the equilibrium potential and the activities of the reactants was given by nernst and this is called as the nernst equation the derivation of nernst equation follows from the first law of thermodynamics the first law of thermodynamics when we look into the mathematical form of the first law it says that del u is equal to q plus w del u represents the change in internal energy and w is the work done on the system this w represents the work done on the system whereas now when here since we are concerning with the electrochemical cell we will consider w as w electric so we can write it as w is equal to minus p del v plus w electric p del v it indicates the mathematical work and the electrical work together so we will write w as a combination of this now we know that the entropy of a given system delta s the entropy of a given system is given as q upon t the q is the heat divided by t represents the temperature so where q is equal to t del s now substituting this in equation del u we get that delta u at constant temperature and pressure is equal to t del s minus p del v plus w electric now also at constant pressure the change in delta enthalpy we know that del h at constant p is given as del u at constant p plus p del v so and at constant temperature the change in gives free energy is given as delta g constant tp is equal to delta h minus t del s so now combining the all our equations combining we find that delta g is equal to t del s minus p del v plus w electric plus p del v minus t del s that is delta g at constant tp is equal to w electric now when we consider a galvanic cell which has two terminals across which the potential difference is e and a charge q is moved through the circuit then the work done that is the w electric is given as eq we also know that q is equal to nf f represents the faraday and q represent the number of electrons involved in the cell reaction so that is why we can again write w electric as minus nfe so combining all the electrons all the sorry equations we find that delta g is equal to minus nfe so this is one of the one equation which represents del g is equal to minus nfe now let us consider a very general chemical reaction where a plus b reacts to form products p plus r the small a b p r represents the coefficient the reaction coefficient so looking at this above equation the change in free energy for the equation given in 1.22 and applying the law of mass action we find that delta g is equal to del g plus g0 plus rt ln activity of p r by activity of a b so this equation in this equation delta g represents the standard del g the free energy delta g is the free energy of the of the uh, of the material whereas del g 0 it's the free energy when all the reactants and products are in their standard states and this is the r t r represents the universal gas constant t is the temperature and a p they are the the ln of ap represents the activity of the products and reactants so combining all this we find del g g0 we can also write in standard state as del g0 is equal to minus nfe0 so ultimately substituting we get that minus nfe is equal to nfe0 plus rt of ln of the concentration activity of the products by activity of the reactants then again dividing both the sides by minus nf we get that e is equal to e0 minus rt by nf ln of activity of reactants by sorry activity of products by activity of reactants alternatively finally we can write it as e is equal to e0 plus rt by nf ln of activity of a of the reactants by activity of the products 
then overall 2.3 rt we introduce the log factor in this equation now substituting the when we substitute the numerical values of r and f and the temperature as 25 degree centigrade or 298 kelvin we find the following acceptable form of non stick equation which is given as e is equal to e0 plus 0.591 by n log of concentration of a to the power of a concentration of reactant a raised to its con coefficient concentration of b reacts to it raised to its coefficient upon the concentration of the products raised to their coefficients this is the most commonly used form of non stick equation that we use every day and this equation is highly predictable and it implies the very with very precision implies the value of e and e0 so here one example of for the utility of non stick equation is provided in the first reaction it is given mn plus is converted to m so n number of electrons are used here at 25 degree now the e of this of this reaction is given as e0 plus 0.59 by 1 by log of m now since the log of m m is a metal and it is in solid state the concentration of m is unit unity so it does not appear in the equation the final is given like this for this particular equation okay so the common the non stick equation can be applied for a various types of equation like if we look into the application of non stick equation for a galvanic cell we can write it as since in galvanic cell we are concerned with copper and zinc the the calculation of the 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 application of non stick equation for a galvanic cell can be given as e cell is equal to e cell 0 plus 0.0591 by 2 log of copper and log of concentration of copper by concentration of zinc here in the denominator the factor 2 is applied because in the galvanic cell reaction the number of electrons in the electrochemical reaction is given as 2 so here we have used 2 for the value of n so now similarly considering another example for the conversion of mno4 minus to mn2 plus in this reaction five electrons are employed which is given here so the non stick equation for this equation for this half of cell will be given as e0 minus 0.0591 by 5 because here five electrons are involved in this reaction so then followed by log of mn2 plus log of water remains zero since it is it is sorry it's one because it is constant followed by the upon the log of mn o4 minus and then h plus to the power raised to its power of its coefficient so h plus to the power 8 so this is how we calculate the emf of a cell using the nonce equation and it is highly applicable and it calculates with precision okay. so the next part we will talk about is cell potential the potential difference between two electrodes that is the two half cells of a reaction they are that is termed as cell potential now the two half cells of a electrochemical cell represents the two electrodes that are converted that are sorry connected properly to the galvanic cells when no current flows through it is called as a emf or we what we call it as the cell potential the cell potential is expressed in units of volts now they, since we know that there is no actually method of exact method of measurement of potential when no current flows through the cell it is apparent that we measure it at a close approximate so the cell potential of a cell can be calculated on a theoretical basis using the non stick equation now these calculations can be mostly done in two ways what we do is in the first case we neglect the we write the neglect the liquid junction potential and we write the emf of the cell is equal to e right minus e left or 
In this case, we find the standard E cell is EMF by E0 cell minus E0 right minus left. However, now here is an example of how to calculate. In the following example 1.1, here we could see the standard put electrode potentials for Cu2 plus 2 Cu and Zn plus 2 Zn has been provided. Now applying the whole value in this equation of the nonced equation, we find we apply the values that has been provided and we find out to be this. But however, the one more easier method to calculate the E cell can be from by using the other expression that is E cell is equal to E0 cell plus 0.0592 by log of activity of copper by log by activity of zinc. Then we include the value of the standard E0 that has been provided to us. The 0.059 by 2, the 2 factor here represents the number of electrons that is involved in the reaction and directly we get the value. So this is one easier method. So it is mostly recommended that we use the standard EMF values and calculate the EMF value of the cell. Okay. So this is how we mostly calculate. Some of the reactions have been provided. Some numericals have been provided for you. Next, we will discuss on the classification and overview of electroanalytical methods. Now, although there are a very wide variety of electrochemical methods, that has been provided to us, a general classification is actually difficult. So mostly what we have done is we, those classification has been based on the changes occurring in the methods. Like for example, the methods where no or very little chemical transformation occurs, we, that has been termed as direct, like direct potentiometry or direct direct voltammetry but in the second type that involves the based on titration procedures like in the so the classification mostly has been divided into two parts in the first case the change is very minimal and that is why it is called as direct and in the second case if the titration procedure is followed we can the analyte is subjected to stoichiometric chemical reactions and that is why these processes are mostly named after titration such as potentiometric titration or amperometric titration on the basis of this various electrochemical methods we have like they have been briefly described like potentiometry so as the name implies potentiometry measures the potential now potentiometry in one case it is known as direct potentiometry in the second case we call it as potentiometry titration when the titration involved is involved it is called as potentiometric titration now in from both the cases the potentiometric titration is more accurate and more precise so coming to direct potentiometry what happens here is the two half cells of the reaction the galvanic cell that is usually and a reference electrode is taken the other the electrode apart from the reference electrode is called as an indicator electrode so both for both these electrodes the indicator electrode is taken and the electrode EMF is given by this equation. So if we know the half cell potential of the reference electrode, then we can easy, easily calculate the half cell of the EMF of the total galvanic cell. Now this is particularly drawn when we know this actually when we, we have a calibration curve for the electrolyte and from looking at the concentration from the slope of the graph, we find out the EMF of the indicator electrode and then finally the EMF of the galvanic cell is calculated. However, one thing that needs to be considered here is the EJ, the liquid junction potential that is it has to be minimal. A minimal liquid junction potential gives a very good value. Now this types electrodes that employs this types of direct potentiometry are called as ion selective electrodes they are mostly used the glass electrode that is used for ph measurement is an example of an ion selective electrodes so these ion selective electrodes are commonly used and for this direct potentiometric for direct potentiometry and this part has been discussed in the next unit okay so one is directly potentiometry the second is potentiometric titrations by far 
potentiometric titration is very appropriately used throughout so these titrations they are formed with a very like titration automatic titration equipment now one the end point of this titration that is referred to as the equivalence point of this titration is derived from the drastic change the amount of the reactant actually the equivalent point is first plotted by using any of the following three procedures like the tangential methods first derivative methods second derivative methods now when we look into these graphs by applying these methods the drastic drop in the in the change in the potential that point indicates the equivalence point of the total titration and that gives us the value of the of our emf so this is how potentiometric titration and direct titration has been used for analysis but till date we are still preferring potentiometric titrations for various analysis now apart from potentiometry we have another analytical technique that is electroanalytical technique that is voltammetry now similar to potentiometry voltammetry it measures <coughs> the amount of the the current flows through the applied potential since the electrolysis in this process it is here the electrolysis is is applied in a controlled manner the particularly in voltammetry the relationship between the current applied and the electrode potential that is generated which varies with the current applied is studied now the total uh, arrangement has been depicted in figure 1.3 as you can see this is the circuit diagram for current potential characteristics now this the vo the voltammetric curves they are particularly called as ie curve that is current potential curve now the, depending on the shape of the ie curve that is the current volt curve we can know the the polarization of our indicator electrode the importance of reference electrode and the part that remains unpolarized so this voltammetry is particularly dependent on the type of the curve that is generated which is called as the ie curve so this part will be discussed in later in greater details the next part a different anal electroanalytical technique is called as polarography now polarography is a particular type of uh, voltammetry which involves a particular electrode which is called as dropping mercury electrode dme and this method the electrode this dme particularly refers to polarography this was originated the use of polarography originated way back in the 1920s and here a platinum wire is immersed in the mercury reservoir a mercury reservoir is taken and the platinum wire is dipped into it and the dme is coupled with a on polarized electrode this figure 1.5 it represents a manual polarography circuit as you can see the mercury the electrode is dipped into a mercury solution the working is similar to that of a voltmeter however we have a power polarography consists of a solution of electroactive substance that is the dm the dropping mercury electrode and a reference electrode and this remains the current potential characteristics that is the ie plot is generated and then which depending on the on the shape and the reading on the galvanometer we find what is how the the emf of the cell now when we look into figure 1 0.6 the figure 1.6 represents a ie curve a typical polarogram now when we look into figure 1.6 we find a term that is residual current this residual current and a term that is called as limiting current these two terms are very important in application of polarography so from the graph we see the graph it first continues and then a steep rise increases up to a certain point and then it continues till it reaches a limiting value so this the limiting value in a particular current is known as the diffusion current or how we define it as id this diffusion diffusing current or the limiting current is given by the equation 708 into nm to the power nm to the power 2 by 3 d to the 
our half t 1 by 6 into c. Now diffusion current in this equation 1.44, n represents the number of electrons, d is the diffusion coefficient, n is the rate of flow of mercury, t is the time and c represents the concentration of mn plus. This 708 represents the various constants that is that involved in the reaction and it represents the whole combination of the constants and other factor factors taking into account this 708 remains constant throughout the equation now when we look carefully into equation 1.44 we find that the diffusion current is directly proportional to c that is the concentration of the mn plus ion in solution so id is directly proportional to c or we can write id is equal to kc where k is a constant and this equation is of great importance in polarography the curve from the curve we can see there is there are two important features from the curve one point this curve 1.6 one is this e half and the other is this limiting current and here we have id so these three features are very important in polarography which will be discussed in gradual sections okay then after polarography we have an important unit that is amperometry now in particularly polarography the principle in amperometry is made to get the equivalent point here the equivalent point is measured by the current flowing through an indicator electrode. Now, this technique is known as amperometric titration. Similar to volt polarometric potentiometric titration, we have the amperometric titration. Now, as the name ampero is here, it indicates the use of current. So, amperometric titration here, amperometry, it indicates the use of current at a constant suitable voltage the voltage must be suitable and it will pass through the solution however the application of amperometry is till date it is very accurate more precise than voltarometric methods and this has been widely used furthermore the most important feature of amperometric titration is that even when the substance is not reactive a very minute amount of the substance can be used for the titration. Over the years, much modification have been made for amperometric indicators and the equivalent point after the titration is done, the equivalent point is obtained by extrapolation through various methods that is through solid by various methods from their linear slopes. Okay. And the equivalent point, it indicates the drastic change or the drastic drop in the current value. So, this, the further analysis of amperometric titrations has been done in other units of this course. Okay. So, after amperometry, we have another electroanalytical technique that is electrogravimetry and the other one is coulometry. So first we'll start with electrogravimetry. Now whenever we have the word gravimetry, it indicates the use of weight. So gravimetry means the weight measured before and after electrolysis. In electrogravimetry, it indicates the amount of the reactant and the amount of the product that changed during the electrochemical reaction so it is one of the like oldest form of electroanalytical techniques it is the electrolysis here is a means used as a means of transformation so during the process of electrolysis the weight deposited on one of the electrodes either it increases or decreases is gives a measure of the electrogravimetry. This method is quite simple to use and it can also be used in the analysis of a single of a like of a single element. If one element is used, we can measure the weight of the sample before electrochemical reaction and the weight of the sample that increased post the electrochemical reaction. And the difference in this method can be used the for the calculation of EMF by applying the nonst equation. Now, practically, metallic deposits have been used for various uh, gravimetric analysis. However, this, although electrogravimetric analysis is still used today, much other techniques have been developed have with higher sophisticated techniques have been developed. But and this has been 
find this finds very less use today now based on the bulk electrolysis method we have one more method that is called as coulometry now it is also a bulk process it is not a surface phenomena it is a bulk electrolysis method where the amount of the constituent to be dependent to be determined is calculated by measuring the quantity of electricity that passes through the solution in electrogravimetry we we measure the weight of the sample before and after the electrolysis process however in coulombometry we measure the quantity of electricity during the electrochemical process and this makes use of the faraday's cell law with by act and that is why since the quantity of electricity is measured here the term coulombometry is used coming from the word coulomb so in other words this method is mostly it measures the amount of electricity that was present before the electrolysis and the amount of electricity that was generated after the electrolysis process so this in coulombometric analysis this is a very accurate 100% electricity efficiency so and it is also dependent on faraday's law so according to faraday's law a given amount of chemical change which is caused by electrolysis is directly proportional to the amount of electricity passed through it so like so in general if we have a chemical change within an electrolytic cell the the total amount of change amount of electricity passed through it is directly proportional to the amount of chemical change brought about by the reaction so the, according to faraday's law we can write na is equal to q by nf where n is equal to the number of moles in the half reaction f is equal to faraday's faraday this is the quantity that corresponds to 6.02 into 10 to the power 23 electrons and that it has been equal to 96 4 85 coulombs and q is the quantity of current electricity that's sorry electricity consumed in coulomb so the value of q can be determined from constant or from various equations now after we determine the value of coulombometry so this coulombometry it has further been classified into two parts one is potentiostatic coulombometry and the second is amperostatic coulombometry in potentiostatic coulombometry here the coulombometry occurs at constant potential the this indicates that the whenever the electro whenever the process happens the potential has to be constant so that only the analyte gets oxy quantitatively oxidized and there is no involvement here like from the graph represented in 1.7 it represents the current and time relationship in potentiometric coulombometry so the amperostatic coulombometry it is the coulombometry where the current is constant in potentiostatic coulombometry the potential remains constant and amperostatic coulombometry the current remains constant so here it is given by amperostat that is it is equal to q the here these two processes are highly efficient processes and the titration is generated here in this titration the titrant is generated at one of the electrodes the reaction takes place directly or on the other electrode the, the re, this reagent have also been used to remove various interferences now coulombometric methods they are they are very capable and they are highly accurate and they have been they are gradually evolved with time and are much in use today now further coulombometric methods will be discussed in other courses so as of now there is another electrochemical method analytical method that we call it as conductometry now this conductometry uses the principle of conductance as the name implies this is a conductance principle so under methods which the involve the charge transport of the ions by conductometric titrations it is observed that conductance which is reciprocal conductance is the reciprocal of resistance and it is directly proportional to the concentration of the electrolyte it has been found that conductance is there has been approximately proportional to the concentration of the electrolyte so this the conductometry utilizes this technique and it 
it has a good sensitivity but however the selectivity is poor since the conductance depends upon the concentration this process has one limitation and that is that it is dependent on the concentration of the ionic species in solution now however working with a conductometry in certain con conventional conductometric methods an ac frequency is used so however currently we are using the various frequencies of ranging to mega cycles per second of a conductometric titrations or a conductimetry has been very accurate and they are they have been used for calculation of capacitors their composites and the preparation of resistors the behavior but type conductometric titrations with singularity at end point has also been obtained this is uh, the conductometric titrations has been discussed in other part of the class okay now <clears throat> when we want to summarize the various types of electroanalytical methods that we have studied up to now so in electrochemical methods have in in general classified into two types one is interfacial methods one is bulk methods the interfacial methods they occur at the interface and the bulk methods they occur inside the whole of the cell interfacial methods are mostly static methods and dynamic methods whereas the bulk methods include conductometry and conductometry titration the static methods where i is equal to 0 are mostly followed by potentiometry and potentiometric titration and the dynamic methods where current flows through the circuit are by potential measurement of potential and they occur by constant current so these processes when the potential is controlled it is it measures voltammetry other amperometric titration electrogravimetry but where the con, con, con current remains constant we are concerned with electrogravimetry that gives us the mass and other coulombic titrations however the vast electrochemical methods that has been presented here has been further elaborated in other sections which we gradually we will learn further so in summary an electrochemical method electroanalytical technique is kind of it, it measures the electrical quantities and their magnitudes with the concentration and analyte of the substance the understanding of electrode potential is of fundamental importance while working with electroanalytical chemistry now an electrochemical cell can convert on electrical energy into chemical energy or vice versa depending upon the type of the spontaneity of the reaction now one of the common cells that we work in electrochemistry is a galvanic cell the emf of a galvanic cell represents the difference between the potential of the two electrodes and the liquid junction potentials that the quantitative relation, relation between electron ele equilibrium potential and the activities of the reactants was given by nost which is called as the nonst equation various electroanalytical techniques have been developed which are used for for today classification and generalization of materials such as potentiometry voltammetry polarography amperometry coulombic and electrogravimetry so these are some of the electroanalytical techniques that we come across today and in the next unit we will study the potentiometric titrations so now we will take a break of 10 minutes we will then again resume after 10 minutes
so coming back to the second unit of today that is uh, potentiometry so this unit briefly describes the importance of potentiometry the various the measurement of potential direct potentiometry potentiometric titration the calculation of equilibrium constants and the summary of the presentation of the use of potentiometry and its calculations in different parts of electroanalytical chemistry so now before going this we'll just have a recapitulation of the nonst potential now from the previous chapter we have find that the nonst potential is given from the following equation represent in 2.4 and this is particularly for 1 by m represents the metal and the e0 represents the standard emf emf is e is the emf of the metal and n here the small n it represents the number of electrons that is involved in the electrochemical process now so with the use of nonst equation we'll go ahead and study the importance of measurement of potential now the emf as we have known it cannot be measured accurately just by placing a voltmeter across the electrons it is actually very difficult so potentiometer is one type of instrument that that is particularly used for the measurement of potential difference between the two circuits so here if we look into figure 2.1 this represents a circuit diagram for a potentiometer here the to understand this the figure has been divided into two parts one is the linear voltage the voltage divider this part the abc part and the second is the galvanic cell part now the two parts they combine and in combination that is gives rise to the measurement of the potentiometer now the working battery of the the it is it has a potential eb it is connected to the terminals of a linear voltage that is a and b here is b so here in the ab we have a linear voltage divider now the particularly the electrical resistance from a to c is directly proportional to the length of the ac that is the resistance of a to c is directly proportional to ac or it is given by k ac is equal to k ac where k is the proportionality constant so in the simplest form the divider consists of a uniform resistor mounted on a meter stick now when we the divider is is precision wire wound resistor now it is formed in a helical coil here the helical coil has been presented and it is represented there so included is a sensitive current detecting device g so what happens here is if you look into the tapping key k here k once the tapping key k is tapped then the potential of the working battery is given by the following principle so here the current i it flows by following ohm's law eab from the point the curve emf of the point ab is given as i r a b from the point a to b now the current passing through a and c is also given by i and the potential between a and c is given as e a c is equal to i r a c so in both the cases we have e a c first we find out e of a b and then e of a c now we can write both the equation as eb is equal to ir ab or eac is equal to ir ac is by k i a b or k into i a c now when we divide this 2.8 equation by 2.7 we get e of ac is equal to e of ab is equal to into e ab into ac by ab so by further following the electrons and the all the cases we have the equation 2.9 it becomes es is equal to e acs minus is equal to eab ac by ab so overall when we look into dividing an equation is by arranging and everything the equation 2.12 represents the final unknown potential of the cell 
which is given as Ex, that is the unknown potential of the cell, by measuring the distance of the cell with the unknown potential and the known EMF of the standard cell. We have the standard cell Es. We know its potential. The AC distance we know, ACS distance we know, and then applying all these values in equation 2.12 we can find the emf of the unknown potent of the unknown cell so this is how a particular potentiometric in a laboratory potentiometric meter works out now we have a standard cell the most commonly used standard cell in potentiometry particularly is the western cell or that is commonly called as western cadmium cell this cell is the standard for measurement of standard potent standard potentiometry so this is given by this equation cd hg single bar cdso4 dot 8 by 3 h2o solid double bar double vertical bar h2so4 solid single vertical bar hg now here in equation 2.13 we see the cd and then in brackets hg is written so this indicates that the solution of cadmium in mercury is taken now when we write the two half cell of these reactions like cd in hg it gives cd2 plus plus hg plus 2e and then hg2 2 plus plus 2e giving rise to 2 hg so the total cell reaction is given here cd plus hgso4 plus 8 by 3 giving rise 8 by 3 h2o giving rise to cdso4 dot 8 by 3 h2o plus 2 hg so this the, from the cell reaction represented here, the total western cadmium cell is written like this. A single vertical bar, it indicates the half cell reaction and the double vertic vertical bar that has been indicated here, it represents the salt bridge that is taken. Now, figure 2.2 depicts a single western cadmium cell. Okay, this is the representation of a western cell. Now the potential of this western cell, it has been measured as 1.0183 volt at 20 degrees centigrade. But this cell, it is value is temperature dependent and it varies with temperature. Now, however, in practice, when we work in reality, these variations are very small. So while using most of the time, we use the value of 1.0183 at 20 degrees centigrade at no current when no current be drawn for longer times. So a typical design it is provided here is provided in sing figure 2.2 the potentiometric titrary measurement using potentiometer it is quite suitable if the galvanic cell has an internal resistance of 10 to the power 3 ohm the cells containing membrane electrodes like glass electrodes they have a high internal resistance and that amounts to greater than 10 to the power 9 ohms how thus to measure the potential of such high resistance now we need to have a voltameter of several magnitude greater and that can measure the cell potentiometer can measure the value properly so if the meter resistance is too high the current draw is drawn from the cell this resulting in lowering its output and thus creates a negative loading error because of this digital voltmeters that we called it as dvm they are preferred for the measurement of potential that has large internal resistance like greater 10 to the power 11 to 10 to the power 12 ohms the digital voltmeters are mostly marketed like they have been mostly marketed as ph meters or what we say as ion meters so for the western cadmium cell the potentiometric titrations are mostly suitable for this lab potentiometric potentiometers they are mostly suitable when the cells have a resistance of less than 10 to the power 3 but for measurement of higher resistance we use 10 to the power 11 or like 10 to the power 12 the dvm digital voltmeters they have been used and they are like very commonly used in today's world in the form of ph meters or ion meters the next is direct potentiometry. As we know, there were two types of potentiometry. One is direct potentiometry and the other is potentiometric titration. So in direct potentiometry, what first we will discuss with direct potentiometry, 
then we'll go for potentiometric titration the direct potentiometric method it uses the single measured electrode potential for a particular for a single ion this method is widely used for the determination of the ph of the solution or determination of other ions using different ion selective electrodes now in all the electro you know, analytical methods we know two electrodes are used one of them the potential which is constant and the which is known as the reference electrode that we already know and the second electrode which whose potential is dependent on the reference electrode is called as the indicator electrode so for a measurement by the direct potentiometric method we use this equation whereas the a e cell is equal to e indicator minus e reference plus e of j where this represents the potential of the junction potential of the of the liquid junction potential this ej represents the emf of the junction liquid junction that we have used now considering here we have an equation that here is an example that depicts the above thing considering we the indicator electrode whose potential vary with cation activities we can write the nonst equation like this e indicator is e not indicator plus 0.0599 by n log of activity of mn plus now substituting all the values and indicating and rearrangement we come across that log of activity of mn plus is equal to n cell minus k by 0.0591 so here we have pm pm indicates the negative logarithmic of the metal activity a of the metal m now as we know ph is the negative logarithm of hydrogen ion concentration similarly pm is the negative logarithm of the metal ion activity and this is given as minus n emf of the cell minus k by 0.059 now 591 this k is a it is a summation of various factors of various constants which includes the standard electrode potential the the junction potential and any other factors so in total for the electrode for the measurement by direct <clears throat> for the measurement by direct potentiometry we have this p of m and p of a is the negative logarithm of the anion a so pm and pa these two this is just the reverse of each other so both these equations may be written as the emf of the cell is equal to e cell is equal to k minus 0.0591 by n into p of x m and this is plus 0.0591 by upon n by p of a so this is the final equation for direct potentiometric equations now whereas but for the determination of this an important factor that needs to be is con that needs to be remembered is the construction of a calibration curve the calibration curve always gives us an idea about the pm and pa so prior to conducting a unknown sample we have to first calibrate the sample curve of the potentiometric curve of the sample and then from the graph we can find out the that by direct potentiometry we can find out the value of the e cell okay so here example is given okay so next we will consider is reference electrodes now we know one is a standard electrode one is a reference the reference electrode and the indicator electrode so the reference electrode some points need to be considered while working with a reference electrode the potential of the electrode remains constant even when some current is passed through it since it is the reference electrode or sometimes it is referred to as the standard electrode its potential has to remain constant even when some current is applied to it the potential should be reproducible the electrode should be easily prepared from readily available materials like it should be economic in nature the potential of the electrode should not change with temperature so the one of the major factors of designing a reference electrode should be the potential should not change with temperature so any material 
whose potential changes with temperature is not fit for a reference electrode. And the last point is it should be cheap. That is, it should be economic in nature. So, for while designing a reference electrode, these factors need to be considered. Now, one very common reference or standard electrode that we all know is the standard hydrogen electrode or we call it as the SHE. She. This is the most important primary reference electrode and the potential is equal to zero under fixed conditions like when the, at 1 atm pressure and unit activity of hydrogen. So this is why the hydrogen has the SHE has been unanimously accepted as a standard electrode in for calculations. The hydrogen ions of the solution, like when we look into figure 2.4, it indicates the design of a common design of a hydrogen electrode here. <coughs> The hydrogen ions of the solution and the gaseous hydrogen, they are kept in equilibrium using a platinum electrode, which coated with a like a platinum black. The platinum electrode is first, it is usually cleaned with chromic acid. It is electrolytically plated from a solution of chloroplatinic acid and with platinum foil as anode. It is important that a jet black deposit is formed and thick deposits like for the use of hydrogen electrodes. After platinizing, the electrode is to be free from traces of chlorine. Since we have used chloroplatinic acid for the design of platinum electrodes, the traces of chlorine, it must be removed from the platinum electrode. So for this, the convenient source of hydrogen is compressed gas available in the market in cylinders. That is, the hydrogen cylinders that are available in the markets are used for this. The gas is purified by passing through glass bottles containing 0.2 molar KMnO4, alkaline pyrogallol, H2SO4 and distilled water. And then the standard hydrogen electrode is prepared. The fig it shows the design here, the figure, it shows the design of standard hydrogen electrodes. Even though hydrogen electrode the, or the SHE is the first primary reference electrode, today we have many other reference electrodes. But by far the standard hydrogen electrode has been like mostly used because of its very of its less complexity and its simplicity the other reference electrodes that have been used they, they require more complicated experimental conditions for their preparations the hydrogen electrode however it is inconvenient in our practical laboratory experiments because the use of hydrogen, it requires a large gas cylinder and as it is hydrogen and air mixture, it is highly explosive in nature. So there is a chance of an explosion when hydrogen comes with air in the daily laboratories. And thirdly, the catalyst that is used is easily po poisoned in normal laboratory conditions. That is why it is always advisable that we maintain a strict atmosphere during a strict and clean atmosphere due for the maintenance of SHE. Hence, for like normal routine laboratory use, other reference electrodes are commonly used. The potential of these reference electrodes, they are first measured against SHE and then they are finally used. The simple and common reference electrodes that we use today mostly are calomel electrode and silver, silver chloride electrode. These two are mostly preferred because they can be easily prepared and they maintain a constant and reproducible potential throughout the laboratory work. So that is why in in contrast to using SHE, the daily laboratory works that we that are concerned with a calomel electrode or a silver silver chloride electrode. Now, calomel electrode it is most widely used because it can be easily prepared and of the consistency of the potential. The calomel half electrode is one which consists mercury or calomel that is mercury one chloride and covered with aqueous KCl solution of definite concentration. It might be 0.1 molar, 1 molar or a saturated KCl solution. If the KCl solution is saturated with the calomel, then the electrode is called as a saturated calomel electrode. The electrode potential of such electrode is 0 0.2, 0 0.412 volt at 25 degrees centigrade as determined against SHE. So the standard 
potential of a calomel electrode was first determined against the SHE and then it was put to use. If the KCL solution is exactly one molar, then the potential is 0 point, sorry, 0 0.2801 volt. And this value, when one molar of KCL is used, the value corresponding to this volt is 0 0.2801 0 .2801 volt. And this electrode is called as standard calomel electrode or SC. E. So, this standard calomel electrode is what is normally used in our daily laboratories. Then the Hubson electrode reaction of a SCE is given by this. So, the, since the mercury is a dimeric process, so I call dimeric species, it is dimer. So, the non-stick equation is given by equation 2.25. Now, Hg2 2 plus is also involved in another equilibrium that is Hg2 Cl2 is slightly soluble salt. So, we can again write it in terms of its solubility product that is Ksp is equal to Hg2 plus into concentration of Cl of minus 2. So, rearranging the above equations and substituting into non-stick equation, we can find that E is equal to E0 minus 0 0.059. 1 by 2 log of Cl2 by Ksp. So, the potential reflects. So, from this equation, the potential reflects the concentration of the Cl minus that is used. This is an important finding. So, the calomel electrodes may be fabricated. They are comes in a variety of shapes and sizes and some of the examples have been shown in figure 2.5. In figure A, it is a laboratory made saturated calomel electrode and in figure C this represents a commercially made calomel electrode. It should be emphasized that an electrode does not depend the potential of any electrode it does not depends on its size. However, the liquid junction potential between the solution and KCL may be established. Sometimes an agar plug we use an agar gel we immerse the liquid junction potential or the salt bridge that is KCL in an agar gel and it is done in a similar way. However, the size is does not affect the potential of the standard calomel electrode. Now, for various purposes, modifications of standard calomel electrodes has been done and they have been substituted accordingly to suit the current applications. The next is the silver silver electrode. This electrode is quite similar to calomel electrode. It consists of a silver wire or a silver plati plated platinum wire coated with a thin layer of silver chloride and it is immersed in a solution of potassium chloride of known concentration. It is represented as AgCl, KCl and single bar Ag. The half Cl reaction is given as AgCl plus electron, Ag plus Cl minus plus Cl minus. Normally, this electrode is prepared with saturated potassium chloride and its potassium and its potential at 25 degree is this 2.199 volt at CAG when the, poten when the potentials with 0.1 and 0 0.1 molar. So, the standard value has been measured against SHB, SHE and it has been given. This electrode is easily constructed as shown in figure C. The electrode, it contains a glass tube. It is fitted with a glass disc and a layer of agar gel and KCL is placed on the top of the disc to prevent the loss of the solution. A portion of the hot suspension is poured it is into the tube which on cooling solidified into a gel. A layer of KCL is placed on the gel and the tube is filled with saturated KCL. A drop of 0.1 molar silver nitrate is added and it is inserted into the solution. This is the general working principle of a silver silver chloride electrode. Then are indeed these are all examples of reference electrodes. Next we will talk about indicator electrodes. An indicator electrode of a cell is one where the potential is dependent on the activity of a particular species whose concentration is to be determined. So, we have several metals like silver, copper, mercury, lead, cadmium that so reversible half reactions for the 
construction of indicator electrodes among all the metals the metals like nickel cobalt tungsten they do not give reproducible potential and hence they are not as used as indicator electrodes usually the metal electrodes these metal electrodes are constructed from coils of wire flat metal metal plates or button in plastic or glass so large surface area is usually preferred the metal surface is first cleaned usually it is achieved by dipping in concentrated nitric acid so and then following by rinsing in water so once the metal surface is cleaned then the metal electrode that is used to be a electrode so it becomes so it is first necessary to saturate the solution where the sparingly soluble salt of a silver electrode will accurately reflect the concentration of iodine so first the silver electrode is dipped into a saturated solution of agi so the reactions involved here is given by this combining this equation and applying nonce equation we find that e is equal to minus 0.51 minus by 0.0591 log of concentration of I minus this type of electrode where silver serves as an indicator electrode is it is called an electrode of the second order because it measures the con concentration of an ion that is directly not involved in the electrode process it is used for the determination of silver ion then it is if for the first order because here in this case the potential is directly dependent on the participant ion so this the silver ion electrode the type here in the indicator electrodes the silver ion electrode is called as a indicator the electrode of second order because it does not measure directly the potential of the silver had it measured the potential of silver directly it would have been called as a first order electrode so in this case agi electrode is called as a second order electrode now next indicator electrodes that are commonly used is the mercury electrode so another important second order electrode this is also a second order electrode that has been used for the measurement of edta and its anion y4 minus is the mercury electrode the half cell reactions may be given by this and the emf is given by this equation so overall the the equation can be written for the mercury electrode the k is given this this electrode is largely particularly used in complexometric titrations that uses eda in general we do not find the use of mercury electrodes much apart from complexometric titrations now there is another class of indicator electrodes that we call it as membrane electrode or ion selective electrode these electrodes they are all called as ion sensitive electrodes because they are responsive to a particular species they respond to a single chemical species the potential between the indicator electrode and the reference electrode varies and the concentration of the activity of that particular species varies so unlike the indica inert indicator electrodes the ion selective electrodes they do not respond to all species the inert indicator electrode is responsive to all the species that are present in the solution so a case of ion selective electrode includes the glass membrane electrode or the glass electrode which are particularly sensitive to one type of ion only and they do not respond to the other ions that are present in the solution so this is also a special case of a indicator electrode and this will be discussed in next other units of this course now once we know about the type of electrodes it is important for determination of equilibrium constant so we know the change in free energy of a reaction is given by del g is equal to del g0 plus rt ln activity of the products by activity of the reactants and that is given by del g is equal to del g0 plus 2.303 rt log k where k represents the equilibrium constant in general in equilibrium constant del g is equal to 0 and combining both the equation non equation and all these equations we find that k log k is equal to nf e cell 0 by 2.3 rt 
n which finally gives us the value of log k is equal to n standard e0 of the cell by 0.0591 and this particular equation has been used where k represents the equilibrium constant and thus the value of k can be known for the from this equation 2.41 for the calculation of equilibrium constant so after the direct potentiometry we come across potentiometric titrations potentiometric titrations are another class which may, which are which is very convenient to use to for the measurement of potential now as the name indicates a potentiometric titration involves the titration and it on, also involves the presence of a equivalence point the equivalence point it is revealed by a drastic change in the plot when we plot the graph we can see with the point which indicates a sudden change in the plot of emf versus the volume of the titration we know that it is the equivalent point so one electrode must be maintained and constant whereas the other electrode it must serve as a indicator so the solution the both the solution it is stored during the titration and the where the plot we plot a graph where in the x-axis the volume of titration is measured and the potential is plotted in the y-axis. The sudden change, the drastic drop in the graph indicates the equivalence point. So one important advantage of potentiometric titrations is their accuracy. The measured potentials, they detect rapid changes and further the it. it the activity, the coefficient activity is also minimized here. The influence of liquid junction is very less, is minimal and the activity coefficients are also minimized. The potentiometric titrations they be, like, has been applied to various, various systems like oxidation reduction, precipitation and all those equations, complexation reactions. They are all measured by potentiometric titrations since they provide accurate data the titrations using different solutions by use of potentiometry has been a very has been a very uh, useful tool for us for measuring the potential now this figure 2.8 it represents a typical potentiometric titration setup so as you can see the solution is stirred and from the buret the titrant is added and finally we, from the potent titration we potential value we find out the equivalence point then the location of endpoints in potassium potentiometric titration the endpoint is detected by determining the vol volume at which a large change in potential occurs the method can be employed for titrimetric purposes like acid based titration redox titration complex formation precipitation and the look at these the titr and the endpoint can be located now from figure 2.9 if we look into this graph these are some of the typical titration curves that has a potentiometric titration curves that has been presented however the the detection of equivalent point is not easy so depending on the type of the graph we find out the drop the, the equivalence point is determined by dropping a vertical line from the graph. Now, as you can see in figure 2.9a, b, c, the figure a is the typical EMF versus volume plot. So, when we drop a per perpendicular to the x-axis, we can find the equivalence point and that gives us the exact value. The volume at equivalence point is just determined by dropping a perpendicular from the peak to volume axis. So the more complete the reaction, the sharper is the peak and hence more accurate is the location of the equivalence point. So this is how we find out the equivalent point in a potentiometric titration. So there are various types of potentiometric titrations. So the majority of potentiometric titrations, they involve chemical reactions such as neutralization, oxidation reduction, precipitation, and complexation. In the neutralization reactions, these are mostly used for the neutralization of acids or polyprotic acids with bases, and then the endpoints are be known. This is it is most easily calculated 
from the pH of the half neutralization reaction. Like we have the Ka is equal to H plus A minus and HA. After neutralization, we find pKa is equal to pH. This is the midway into the equivalence point. So it is important that a dissociation where Ka represents the dissociation constant. The dissociation constant differ from a potentiometry titration may vary from that shown in the dissociation constant. So it is also okay that sometimes the Ka might vary from the original value that is reported in literature to that it is the we found out in potentiometric titrations. Next is the use of potentiometric titration in oxidation reduction reactions. This involves electrodes for oxidation reduction reactions and the metal must be unreactive at the with respect to the components, it is just a site of transfer, electron transfer. The platinum electrode actually is the most widely used electrode for oxidation reduction reactions. The equivalent point may be slightly different from the potential corresponding to the point of inflection in the curve. So when we look into the this equation 2.46, it represents the general form of representation of EMF by oxidation reduction titration. Then other titrations involve precipitation titrations. The titrations that involve the precipitation reactions are not so numerous in titrometric analysis. However, and their use is limited. In some cases, the rate of the reaction is also very low and the equivalence point also it might not exist and it is very difficult to calculate the equivalence point. However, theoretical curves for potentiometric titration have been like derived. So using this, for example, the potential of silver electrode during the titration of silver iodide has been given by this, which ultimately represents is given by this. However, these precipitation titration reactions are very uncommon and mostly silver iodide has been the preferred choice. Complex step formation titrations are used where complexes are formed and mostly mercury electrode is used and it is used for EDTA titrations as shown in figure 2.10. Then is differential titration. This titration, it involves the use of two identical indicator electrodes. Here one of the electrodes is contained in a small side arm test tube as you can see in figure 2.1 this is a setup for differential potentiometric titration so one of the electrodes is contained in a small side arm test tube the contact is made through a hole with the bulk solution because of this restriction the composition of the surrounding solution will not be immediately affected by the addition of the titration to the bulk of the solution the resulting differences it gives rise to a potential difference that is delta E and after we measure the delta E several times if the volume of the solution increases or decreases or it can be negligible small the main advantage of this method is the elimination for the we don't need a salt bridge for such type of titrations differential titrations and then from the plot we can find out the measurement the total from the plot of we can find the emf then the automatic titrations nowadays large number of automatic titrators based on the principle of potentiometry they have come to the market two different automatic titrators are commonly available the first type they give the titrations of v versus e or most commonly del e by del v versus v the end point is obtained from the graph. So here in this automatic titration, we plot a graph where in the y-axis, we take del E by del V and in the x-axis, the volt is plotted. So from this graph by extrapolation, we can find out the actual value. In the second type of automatic titration, it is stopped when the potential of the electrode it, reach, it reaches a value and the volume of the reagent is recorded. So these titrators usually employ a burette with a solenoid operated value that controls the flow 
and it monitors the potential of the solution. However, in both the cases of automatic titrations, the plot of del E pi V upon versus V is usually considered accurate and this has been mostly used for automatic titrations. So in summary, in this unit, we have come across various princip the principles of potentiometer and the measurement of potential by why we have talked about different types of reference electrode, hydrogen electrode, calomel, silver, silver chloride electrode. Also, we knew about different type of indicator electrodes, different type of titrations, potentiometric titrations, such as acid-based titration, redox titrations, precipitation, complexometric, and automated titrations has also been discussed here. So with this, we end the second chapter, the unit two of this on polarimetry. The next chapter concerning uh, the other electroanalytical techniques will be discussed in next class. So any doubts for today? So there is no more questions, then thank you for today's class. We'll meet, meet in next class. Thank you.